everyone. Hello. I am Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, and urban legends. If you would like to support our little show and get a bunch of extra content and early and ad-free episodes, please sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And please check out our website at paradiseafterdark.com. On our website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. Pretty much everything Paradise After Dark. Yes. Uh, we also, if you go to our website, have a virtual tip jar there. You can give us a tip and we'll give you a shout out on the show. So, speaking of shout outs, it's not really a shout out, but we wanted to let our listeners know that we will be attending an event next month in February. Actually, <sighs> it's going to be so cold for Ken, guys. So cold February for Ken. February 19th at Dog Tap Columbus. Dog Tap? Is that like Dog a- Tap Columbus is like the a- name of the... Is that a brewery? It is a brewery. Sweet! In uh, Canal Winchester, Ohio. It's actually a night with TCG. A night with True Crime Garage. Oh, it's yeah. It's their event. We're but, just going. But we will be going. So we're sort of promoing for them, but we're also like, hey, if you want to hang out with us. Yeah, you if you're can- going to be in the in the Columbus area or in that vicinity, feel free to swing in and say hi to us. You know, that's Or cool. True Crime Garage for that matter. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> but, you know, whatever it is. But You can get tickets to the event at True Crime Garage's website. That's truecrimegarage.com. And um, we won't charge you to meet us, but you're going to have to buy a ticket to the event. So Yeah. We'll be there, so just let us know. We'll be there. There'll be an after party, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. They're they're such a good time, too. Nick and the captain are such a good time. They're so fun to hang out with. So we're super excited about going. Only thing I can say about hanging out with them is bring Red Bull and 5-Hour Energy. Yes. And damn. um, (laughs) Yeah, they don't stop really, like, (laughs) ever. Exactly. So, Lauren, you want to give us kind of a a recap, sort of a, a... a quick overview of what we just did yesterday. All right. So this is part three of the Sun Jim Gang saga. We're going to try to squeeze it all in, folks. There's still a lot of stuff left. Okay. So far, we have the Sun Jim Gang, which basically consists of three main members. I would say Daniel Lugo, Adrian Dorball, and Jorge Delgado. So they've already kidnapped a man named Mark Schiller. They kept him in a warehouse for 30 days. They made him sign over all of his assets, including his home, all of his money, his bank accounts, even his life insurance policy was signed over to them. And then they tried to kill him in several different ways, but he survived. So Mark Schiller survives and he somehow gets a hold of Ed Dubois, who is a famed private investigator in the Miami area. Ed Dubois at first doesn't believe the story. Then he starts to believe the story. He starts to try and help, but he cannot get any law enforcement from the regular Miami PD all the way up to the FBI to even believe this crazy story. So nobody is doing anything about this. So what happens is the Sun Jim gang is free to do it again. And now we're at the point where they have set their sights on another victim. Frank Grigia. Yeah, Frank Grigia was a wealthy businessman who basically created his wealth uh, with nine seven six numbers. If you're if you if you're born in two thousand, you have no idea what that means. But back in the day, nine seven six numbers were a way that you could pay per minute. You called in and you could get tips on anything, whether it was like car stuff. I mean, everything. But the big money maker was sex phone lines. Yes. So this is where he got a lot of his money. So what they do is they put together this plan. Now, they're going to bring in Sabina. If you remember her, she was Lugo's Lugo's, girlfriend. Exactly, Lugo's girlfriend. So they're going to bring her in because she thinks that these guys are CIA agents. So she's excited. They told her that they're CIA agents. She's pumped. So they're doing, they're, now they're on this stakeout slash mission, basically the sting operation, so to speak. Right. So he, they, they get her involved in the job. So what they're going to do is they're going to snatch Grigia, right? They're going to go to his mansion, snatch him. Now, her job is once the Lamborghini that he drove, his famed Lamborghini, is pulled out of the garage, the Mercedes is going to – she's going to back the Mercedes in. They're going to put Grigia and Grigia's girlfriend, 
handcuffed and gagged into the trunk of the Mercedes. But Sabina, she's so concerned about the girlfriend because she's not involved in this. And she's like, hey, why do we have to kidnap her? And they tell her, well, we have to take her because if we let her go, she could alert the authorities and ruin the whole sting operation. So they promised her, hey, nothing's going to happen to her. So then that kind of brings us to where we are right now. Now, this is the plan that they've put together. Yes, this is where we left off yesterday in part two. And please, if you haven't listened to part one, part two, go back, listen, because none of this is going to make much sense if you don't. Even if you do, sometimes it don't make sense once you get further <laughs> along here. All right. So here we are with Attila Wieland. Now, remember, Attila Wieland was the ex-husband of Beatrice Wieland, who was Adrian Dorball's girlfriend. Now, he's the one who set up the meeting between Dorball and Lugo and Frank Grigia. So Attila Wieland arranged a meeting for Dorball and Lugo with Grigia. Lugo did the talking explaining that he and Dorball were offered a lucrative investment opportunity through Interling International Inc., which actually was a legitimate telecommunications company expanding into India. He provided authentic Interlink color brochures with pie charts and text indicating phenomenal growth potential. Its only real competition was AT&T. They were seeking only serious investors He'd have to chip in between 500000 and $1 million to get in. Grisha was interested. He might even want to invest more than a million, particularly if they could develop some action with cell phone use in South Asia. Lugo agreed to look into that possibility. They knew what to do. They knew to use the phone thing because they knew that this, this guy knew the phone business. Right. So once they arrived home, Lugo told Sabina the abduction of the Golden Beach couple would go down tomorrow. That evening, she watched in her living room as he and Dorball packed their FBI equipment, guns, handcuffs, ropes, syringes, and rompun, a tranquilizer used to sedate horses and other large animals. Because, you know, that's standard issue with the FBI yeah. and serial killers. I think yes. once you apply for a serial killer <laughs> job and you graduate, that's what you get. That's your, you get the rope and the tranquilizer. Rompun. Exactly. So they just fill you in because that's what they're supposed to have. So on the way to Grease's house the next morning, now this is Sunday, May 21st, they realized, they forget, they forgot the duct tape. So Dorball tried to enter a convenience store to buy some, but his gun was sticking out of the back of his pants. And Lugo had to run and catch him before he entered the store. So they drove on toward Golden Beach. There's no incident here, so okay, nobody saw the gun, we're good. And Lugo called Grease from his cell phone to ask if they could stop by. So Grease says, no problem. When they arrived at the house... The two men quickly got out of the car. Sabina saw Lugo, who was carrying a laptop computer in one hand, stick a gun into the waistband of his nylon sport shorts with the other. As he and Dorball approached the front door, Lugo clumsily knocked over a garbage can. Christina answered the door. You can't make this shit up. She waited and waited for the garage door to open, just like they had planned. But then Dorball and Lugo came out of the house empty-handed. Apparently, they had chickened out. Oh, my God. So they abort, needed... Abort, abort, <laughs> abort, They needed a new plan. So they they decided to invite Grisha and his wife to dinner the following evening. Grisha accepted the invitation for dinner. That evening, before dinner, Sabina sat on Dorball's couch as Lugo explained her role to her. When the foursome returned from the steakhouse... Sabina was to pretend she was Lugo's Russian wife. She would befriend Christina, make her feel good until the men lured Grisha into another room to take him down. She waited for hours. Lugo showed up at midnight alone, looking distressed and saying the dinner went well, but he'd have had a fight with Dorball. Yet another mission aborted. So now here we are. It's Wednesday, May 24th, 1985. And they tried again, and again, it's a dinner date. And Lugo and Dorball arrived at Grisha's residence about 8 p.m., just as Grisha and Christina was returning from purchasing a jet ski. So they've been out shopping today. They purchased a jet ski. Now they're coming home. Lloyd Alvarez, now this is a friend who sold and worked on jet skis, was at the home as well. So now we got somebody else that's there. Now while Grisha and Christina went upstairs to clean up, Lugo and Dorball chatted with Alvarez. 
They discussed jet skis, electronics, and Dorball and Lugo were fascinated by Alvarez's digital beeper and its displays. They talked about owning a fledgling watercraft business of their own and asked Alvarez for his business card. Because, you know, these guys are into everything. They know yes. everything about everything. That's that's the kind of guys you're dealing with. Yeah. Shysters. Exactly. But, I mean, they're, so they're fascinated with this guy, but they're trying to, like, basically get involved with this guy. And I think maybe too much for some people that are planning to right. m- kidnap some people. But then another unexpected visitor arrived. It was the neighbor, Judy Bartutz out walking her dog. She'd seen all the cars in the driveway and stopped by to say hello. She knew Lloyd Alvarez and was introduced to Lugo and Dorball, guys with a phone deal in South Asia. Grisha said he'd be sure to tell Judy's husband, Gabor, more about it after tonight's business dinner. So he Grisha's already talked to the neighbors about it? Yes. Oh, Jesus. And as they were leaving out the door, Esther Toth, a Hungarian housekeeper, unexpectedly arrived with her four-year-old. She, too, deserved an introduction. Then the phone rang. It was Grisha's stockbroker friend. No, he couldn't join them for dinner. He had been tied up with work. But he'd speak to Grisha tomorrow about the interlink deal. Finally, they were able to get out the door. Now, when Judy Bartutz got home, she unleashed her dog and went to talk to her husband, saying, hey, you know, those guys are there. These are the people that Grisha was going to talk to you about. She told him that she was there and that the couple that Grigio was talking about were having a dinner date and they were leaving. She thought Frank seemed a little nervous. So basically she, she kind of felt that there was something wrong going on and she didn't like his new partners, this Dorball and Lugo people. She didn't, you know, she was kind of meeting them, didn't really know. But she's nervous about them. Sometimes you get that sixth sense. Exactly. So, you know? so Gabor asked, he said, what's, what's wrong with them? I'm not sure why I feel this way. But Frank wasn't the same. I think Frank is in a world of trouble. I guess this is Judy's intuition. Yeah. Do you feel like it was? Her intuition was correct. Exactly. So the restaurant was closed by the time they arrived. So the party moved to Dorball's Main Street townhouse apartment. It didn't take long for things to go down. Dorball took Grisha into a separate room to talk business while Lugo and Christina sat on the couch watching TV. Soon they heard yelling and a loud crash. They jumped up to investigate. They found the two men in a vicious fight, blood running down Grisha's head, where he'd been smashed above the ear with a hard, blunt object. Christina glanced around the room. Blood splattered on the computer screen and the sliding glass door. There was blood on the walls. It was all Grisha's blood. So he they hit him hard enough to just blast him open. Basically. As she watched in horror, Dorball took her lover in a headlock and proceeded to strangle him. She screamed and Lugo clamped a hand over her mouth and tackled her. She was handcuffed and her feet bound with duct tape. They wrapped tape over her eyes and mouth as well. Then Dorball injected her with the rompun. Within moments, she was unconscious. They pulled a ninja hood down over her head. For good measure, they gave Grisha a hefty squirt of rompon too. Well, after taking a minute to compose themselves, so this is all happened, they got to take a break for a minute, the two men checked their victims. To their horror, Grisha was dying. This, this is not how things are supposed to go. And Christina wasn't far behind him because they had actually overdone it with the rompon. Grisha was dying and they hadn't gotten a single penny out of him. They'd taken everything from Schiller, but couldn't kill him. And now, Grease is dying, and they're not getting anything. So maybe someday they'll get it right. Maybe, someday. Hopefully. Not. But but Christina was still alive, and they tried to get as much info as possible out of her before she inevitably died. Particularly the front door keypad numbers to their house. Yeah, because that's important. I mean, could you just imagine what's going on right now? I mean, it... This is insanity. It is. And you put yourself in the room. This is insanity. Put yourself in that room where all this is going down. So here they abort missions left and right, left and right. They have these whole things planned and everything could go. For some reason, they back out. And here they are. And all of a sudden, it just like on a whim and a reaction, it all starts to unfold. But then now they've really messed up. So two miles away, Jorge Delgado had waited at the home for a phone call. Now, he was supposed to assist Lugo and Dorball once they subdued Grigia and Christina, then help transport the couple's 
to Lugo's warehouse. This is the same warehouse that they took Schiller. They were going to take them there for a preliminary round of torture and extortion to try to beat them. Do the same thing they did to Schiller, basically. And the phone never, the phone never rang. So here's Jorge saying, ah, shit, they backed out again. So he just goes to bed. So Lugo and Dorball stuff Grigia in the bathtub until they could figure out what to do with him. When Delgado's phone finally rang the next morning, it was Lugo. But he had awful news. There'd been a struggle at Dorball's place. Grigia was already dead. The girl was unconscious. They had her shot full of rumpen, a horse tranquilizer, as we mentioned, to keep her quiet. Delgado raced to the townhouse to help with damage control. I can only imagine he's like, oh, my God, what's going on? So he hauls ass there. But by the time Delgado got there, Christina was starting to come around. Now, they pulled back the tape from her mouth, but immediately she freaks out. She becomes hysterical, and Lugo ordered another shot of tranquilizer. So Dorball injects her into the ankle. Now, they yanked her up onto or into a sitting position and began to press her for answers. You know, what's the security code? So they're trying to get the information. Hey, what's the security code at the house? We need to know these numbers. You know, where are the numbers? What's going on? And she doesn't understand anything that's going on here because obviously she's she's still coherent of what she witnessed. She's coming to. She's still a little groggy. So Christina spoke mainly Magyar. Now, this is a language of native Hungary. Now, she knew little English. So here she is, like we said, dazed, delirious. And she was now incoherent in any language. So it doesn't matter what she spoke. She could have spoke Swahili. She had no idea what the hell was going on. So now they made her drink water and they slapped her in the face trying to get her focused. In a slow, slurred speech, she recited some numbers. So Lugo starts writing down the numbers on a yellow legal pad. And again, Dorball injects her with more tranquilizer. And now she's starting to like get groggy, grow quiet, and then she just kind of goes still. So, Dorball and Lugo decided to call Sun Gym powerlifter and karate expert John Raimondo, a 6 feet 5, 250 pound guy who was also a six year employee of the Miami Dade County Corrections Department. But that didn't matter because Raimondo liked to brag that when he wasn't babysitting inmates at the jail, he was out committing home invasion robberies. You're bragging about that? They'd heard he'd also claimed to be an expert at body disposal. Is right? there really an expert rating for that? <laughs> I guess. Raimondo was driving with fellow weightlifter and regular at the Sun Gym, Santiago Gonzalez, when they got the call from Lugo and Dorball. They told him they needed to help to dispose of two bodies and said they would pay. Raimondo talked it over with Gonzalez, who called Lugo and Dorball clowns, and said he wanted nothing to do with any of it. Smart man. Raimondo said he'd do it for $50,000. Dorball conferred with Lugo, then countered an offer of his own. They didn't have fifty grand, but they could pay $9,000 in cash, plus a presidential Rolex and a $250,000 Lamborghini Diablo. Yeah, excuse me, I don't have enough money to give you fifty grand, but I can give you a Rolex and a Lamborghini. Suspicious? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. That's where the, this case is absolutely mind-boggling. Once Romando arrived at the apartment and realized that Christina was still alive, he told them, you'll have to take care of the girl. And once she was dead, he'd be back and dispose of the body. Because you can't dispose of a body if it's not a body. He's not into murdering somebody. He's into disposing of dead bodies. So he looked at the men, and on his way out, you know, he added, you guys are amateurs. Which, as anybody listening to this case that it listens to true crime like we do, you realize just how rookie these guys are idiots. at this point. I think I've said idiots like 478 times yeah. during this entire recording. Mind blown. So now he had the keypad numbers to Grease's front door. He thought he did anyway. Lugo decided to check out the house. If he could just get to Grisha's safe and financial records and into the computer, the mission might not be a total failure. But the numbers that Christina gave him didn't work. And their dog inside the home was barking furiously. And Lugo was furious. He went back to the car and called Dorball, demanding that he wake her up and ask her again for the numbers to enter the home. Dorball set the phone down for a moment, then came back on the line and told him, Lugo, that Christina was dead. Well, back at Dorball's apartment, the men waited 
for Romando to show up and help dispose of the bodies. Because now they took care of Christina as he requested. And, and basically, it became clear that they have literally wasted their time. They've committed murder. They've wasted their time. They've done this, and they don't have anything. And Raimondo's not coming to help them yeah. dispose of the body. Exactly. And now they're going to have to do that themselves. So on Friday morning, May 26, the plane was set. Jorge Delgado drove to a U-Haul franchise just off the Palmetto Expressway and rented a white Ford van. Lugo and Dorball, meanwhile, went to the Home Depot in Miami Lakes. Their purchases filled two lumber carts. They bought red plastic cleaning buckets, 10-gallon containers of ready road repair tar, floor fans, industrial strength towels, a 100-foot roll of hefty bags, propane gas tanks, face goggles, and gardening gloves, a black iron security grate, the kind that fits over a window, a fire extinguisher, and an 18-inch gas-powered chainsaw. The total, which they put on Doorball's American Express card, came to $666 with tax. Wow. Yeah. 666. They met Delgado back at the townhouse. Frank Grigio was wrapped in a shroud of linen sheets and stuffed into Mark Schiller's stolen couch, sandwiched under the black leather cushions. They deposited Christina in a U-Haul clothing box amid styrofoam popcorn. Lugo and Dorball carried the sofa outside and hoisted it into the van. Christina's box followed. Then everyone hopped in for a ride to Lugo's warehouse in Hialeah. When they pulled inside, Delgado's face lit up at the one welcome sign before him. Frank Grigia's sunshine yellow Lamborghini. It had been the one detail they'd managed to take care of the day before. So, if you guys didn't catch that, let's just clarify. They took a couch from Schiller's home. Remember when they, they had the, the, the muscle heads come over and help them pack the stuff? They took the couch and they bring it now. They're putting a dead corpse into the couch so that way people think that they're just moving furniture outside of the home right. into a U-Haul. Yes. So he's stuffed in the couch. And let's take a quick break and a word from our sponsors. So they unloaded the corpse onto hefty bags. They had spread out all over the warehouse floor. So they had trash bags on the floor. They've unloaded the corpses. And Christina was stiff with rigor mortis. And Lugo used scissors to cut away her red leather miniskirt and vest. And they removed Grease's clothes, except for his underwear and the ninja hood that they had covered the gaping wound on his crushed skull. Because remember, they had busted him up pretty good. Now, Lugo sprayed both bodies with Windex, then scrub them clean with heavy-duty towels to remove any fingerprints. Does that actually work? I don't know. I don't think so. But no one could put together the chainsaw because they remember they had bought a chainsaw from Home Depot. And they couldn't get this put together. So they took turns going over the instructions in the manual and finally assembled the chainsaw. But when they cranked it up, it seized and stalled. Now, they neglected to fill its small reservoir with motor oil. So Delgado goes to buy some, as well as snacks at Subway. But when he returned with the oil, the chainsaw still wouldn't start. So somehow, when they were trying to start it, they'd burn the engine up. <laughs> I mean, that's how, that. this is like just, this is why if you, the, it, we hate to laugh. We're not laughing at the actual events that have occurred. We're laughing at how stupid, stupid these guys really are. And- the sad part is, is most people think that when it comes to killers, murderers, serial killers, and people that do this stuff all the time, that they're diabolical and they're so smart. When sometimes I think they're just idiots that get lucky, which is where these guys are right now. Meanwhile, Esther Toth, the gracious housekeeper, arrived for work that Friday morning and stopped in her tracks on the doorstep. The dog, Choppin, was barking like a crazed wild animal at the door, and she was afraid to enter the home. She walked over to the neighbor and asked Judy Barutz, one of Christina's best friends, to accompany her. They punched in the keypad numbers, opened the door, and Barutz's heart sank. The place was a disaster. Choppin had torn it apart. There was just one island of undisturbed calm in the living room coffee table, which rested two glasses. So the dog is freaked out because the, the owners haven't been home, obviously, for a while and destroyed the house. Yes. 
She remembered Frank's new business partners had been sipping drinks that night. They'd stop by to take Frank and Christina to dinner. Another bad sign, her friends would never have left the dog unattended. He was like a child to them. Judy realized that Frank and Christina had never come home from their Wednesday business dinner. Now, Judy told Esther to feed the dog and go home and not to touch the glasses on the coffee table. Then she raced back to her own house to tell her husband, Gabor, the disturbing news. While he began calling their network of Hungarian friends, she drove toward Miami Lakes, heading to Shula's Steakhouse, where Frank had said the group was going for dinner. She didn't spot the Lamborghini, but a parking attendant down the block remembered it parked right on Main Street late Wednesday. It's a yellow Lamborghini. It's pretty easy to spot. Judy drove slowly along Main. The car wasn't there, but she did see a gold Mercedes. She'd seen the gold Mercedes in Frank's driveway on Wednesday night. She wrote down the license plate number and headed back home. Thank goodness for nosy neighbors. Am I right? (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, You are right. They finally called the Golden Beach Police Department. Within minutes, Chief Stanley Kramer met the Barutzes in Grisha's driveway. Judy punched in the numbers on the front door keypad, took him inside, and explained the circumstances of their friend's disappearance. The people who lived there were in trouble, the chief said. Exactly. He's well aware of what's going on, and it, situations like that are never good. So, meanwhile, while all that's transpiring, Lugo, the mastermind that he is, he decides he needs to return this broken chainsaw to Home Depot for a refund. Then he went to the Lawn Garden Department, taking no chances this time. He bought a fully assembled Remington power cutter. Now, this was an electric chainsaw, and it came with a one-year guarantee to handle all of your cutting chores quickly and easily. This is what this guy's mindset is, because none of these guys can put it together. So he's like, you know what? I need to buy this assembled. We can't deal with this no more. We've got work to do. Now, back at the warehouse, he and Doorball lifted the heavy window security grate over the two 55-gallon drums that they had purchased. Now, this iron platform would be Doorball's surgery table. They'd lay the bodies atop the grate, um, and the drums would catch the blood, because they remember they got to keep the shop clean, and they got, I mean, you got to be smart about this. I don't think they ain't smart about these guys. Lugo and Delgado chose not to stay for this grisly dismemberment. They moved to the front of the warehouse while Doorball went back to work on the bodies. For five minutes, they heard whirling sound, drone sounds of the saw as it sliced through flesh and bones. They heard six, maybe seven prolonged cuts and then silence. The saw spurted again and then it just abruptly quit. So the saw is working, then it stops, then it fires back up, and now it quit again. So as Doorball was trying to cut off Christina's head, her hair got caught in the chain. And so Doorball finally yanked the saw out of her hair. But now it was jammed, and the saw that they went back to Home Depot and purchased was useless. So all that work to go back to Home Depot and get this new saw is ruined because of the hair. So there was no way that Lugo was going back to Home Depot with the now bloody chainsaw. They would have to finish the job with hatchets. Lugo changed into gym clothes, pulled on some gloves, and went back to help Doorball. For another 10 minutes, Delgado sat alone and listened to heavy thumping, loud banging, and the cracking of bones and assorted noises as his pals chopped up two bodies into pieces. When it was over, Christina's legs, ending in bloody stumps, jutted skyward from the 55-gallon drum. Her torso had been shoved in upside down. Grigia's headless neck rose from another barrel. Both receptacles contain a mixture of road tar and a splash of muriatic acid to speed decomposition. The electric saw had whirled clumps of blood, gristle, and tissue about the warehouse floor. Christina's head lay in a red bucket. Grisha's head was in another. A third red bucket held four hands and four feet. But wait, what about that identification? Oh, that's right. They need to remove the teeth, fingers, and faces. So they removed the heads from the bucket and placed them on a nearby table. Using pliers, they proceeded to extract the victim's teeth, but the roots wouldn't budge. So they brought out the hatchet again. They chopped down through the bridge of the nose, then hacked into the eyes, destroying the orbits at the midpoint. Once through the bone of the outer eye sockets, they continued hacking down clear through the jaw. They pulled the faces back from the skulls. This gave them good access to the gums and teeth from any direction. 
They carefully sliced off the fingers. For more delicate work, like filleting fingerprints from the flesh, they employed a Pakistani hunting knife with a six-inch blade. So here's some guys that are not very good at planning all this, and then this this event transpires. Now they have to react, and they're almost acting like just mobsters. I mean, from what you would picture like a mobster movie where they've got to dispose of a body, these guys react and start going into this, we've got to destroy the bodies in the evidence mode. So remember, these guys are FBI agents that work at a gym, and they have all this mastermind stuff. But deep down, these guys are sick. That's not something the average person can handle. But these guys are in there doing it. So now later on, Lugo would attempt to burn the body parts in a barrel in the street right outside the warehouse. But Degato stopped him, telling him that anyone could drive down the street and see him. Duh. I mean, you're going to go out back and start burning body parts. This guy's an idiot. So at 7.30 a.m. the following morning, Lloyd Alvarez, now this is the friend that was at the Grease's home the night that Lugo and Dorball came by to pick up the couple for dinner, spotted Grease's yellow Lamborghini traveling between two other cars. It was a There was a Chevy Suburban and, of course, a gold Mercedes. Now, he followed the trio of cars and recognized Lugo in the Mercedes because he had met him. He's like, oh, that's the guy. We know him. So he began following Lamborghini, and when he got close enough, he saw a huge stranger at the wheel. He wasn't sure who this was. Now, he didn't recognize this guy at all and the driver of the Chevy Suburban, so he breaks off the pursuit. He has no idea who these people are, but he knows that that's the Lamborghini, and he's well aware that nobody would really be in this Lamborghini except Grigia. So on Sunday morning, Grigia's Lamborghini was found three miles west of the Florida Turnpike, just near Okeechobee Road. The car was abandoned in a desolate wooded area known to police as a weekend site for Santeria rituals. The doors were left open, the windows down, and the keys were still in the ignition. Okay, later that afternoon, Lugo and Dorball recruited another gym member, little Mario Gray, to help them with their next task. Now, the plan was to drive to the warehouse that night and move the barrels. This is the barrels with the bodies inside, which had now been welded shut. So together, Gray, Lugo, and Dorball lifted the barrels into a rented truck. Now, two of the drums were especially heavy. And as Gray lifted one of them, acrid smoke puffed out from a tiny little hole in the barrels. Now, as the three men drove to a drainage ditch in southwest Miami and heaved the barrels into the murky water, the drums settled next to a submerged refrigerator. Eight days after the disappearance of Grigia and Christina, Captain Al Harper, the 27-year Metro-Dade police veteran who had tried to help him with the Mark Schiller kidnapping, phoned Ed Dubois and they began to collaborate with a police investigation. Oh, so now we're going to believe him. Beatrice Whelan and Attila Whelan were contacted by police and they started talking. Attila Whelan started frantically calling Doorball. The police are everywhere. They want to talk to you. They consider Frank dead. I told the police everything, Adrian. So did Beatrice, he said. That afternoon, Daniel Lugo stopped by Dorball's townhouse to try and make a plan. Things were suddenly going very badly. Finally. Lloyd Alvarez had seen them on the road. Beatrice was talking to the cops, and so was Attila. Not to mention the people who'd been at Grigia's house as they were headed out for dinner that Wednesday. Alvarez, the housekeeper and her child... Their neighbor, Judy Barutz, whose husband was Frank's business partner. What a shit show. Absolute shit show. So, real quick, we will BRB. So, Dubois gets together and runs down the facts of the Schiller case with Captain Harper. Now, Harper, of course, he's excited. He feels a shot of adrenaline flowing because he's ready to go. Now, Harper had just overheard at roll call that suspects were under surveillance in the possible abduction of the wealthy Hungarian businessman and his girlfriend. Now, the suspects worked at a gym, and their names had a familiar ring. Could they be the same group Dubois had identified back in April? Hmm. Now, Harper told Dubois that he had talked to the homicide team investigator, Sergeant Felix Jimenez. They had arranged to meet at Dubois' North Miami office. So, Jimenez sat dumbfounded as he listened to Dubois' story of Schiller's kidnapping how the Sun Jim boys had nabbed Schiller at his franchise delicatessen near the airport, held him chained to a warehouse to a wall for a month, tortured him until he signed over all of his assets. 
how they tried to kill him in a fiery crash, run him down twice for good measure, how he'd miraculously survived all this and was trying to get his life back in order while he was in Columbia. And Dubois explained how he had offered the information and documents to Metro Police in April only to be blown off by the police. And Dubois had also turned over incriminating documents he had found in Mies' office. If you all remember, he found them in the trash can. Now, these documents linked Mies financially with the Sun Jim Gang's new holdings. The detectives had all this information over six weeks and just sat on it, and in turn allowed it to happen again, only this time was worse, because they succeeded. And they killed two people. Exactly. Dubois called Schiller and asked if he would come back to Miami to help. On Friday, June 2nd, 1995, Mark Schiller returned to Miami. It had been nearly two months since his last visit to the police headquarters when his complaint had been considered so ludicrous that the Strategic Investigation Division wouldn't even take it, had punted it over to robbery. This time he told his story to Sergeant Felix Jimenez and lead investigator Sal Garofalo. This time, no one suggested he was lying, and no one dared him to take a polygraph. Meanwhile, Lugo and Dorball showed up at the Solid Gold Strip Club to confront Beatrice. After they grilled her, she hurried backstage where she called the lead homicide detective, Detective Sal Garofalo, and left a message that Dorball and Lugo were at Solid Gold asking questions. Next, she called Attila. He said he'd be right there. When she emerged on stage to perform, she glanced around the room, and Lugo and Dorball were gone. The next morning, Metro-Dade police served warrants on the houses of Daniel Lugo, Jorge Delgado, Noel Dorball, and John Meese. Lugo had already taken off to the Bahamas. George Delgado and his wife, Linda, who had worked as Schiller's secretary when he first offered her husband a job, laughed aloud at the arrest warrants as they were read to them. But, under interrogation at police headquarters, Delgado began to talk. Yes, he hired Lugo to collect money Schiller owed him, but Lugo got carried away. When his lawyer showed up, Delgado declined to speak further. As Adrian Dorball was being driven down to the station, officers searched the townhouse for evidence. The items they collected, furniture, jewelry, electronics, computer equipment, and software— Bric-a-brac, even subscription magazines, had come from Schiller's house. One particularly odd item was a framed photo of Mark and Diana Schiller taken on their honeymoon. Why would, why would anyone keep that? I don't know. At his interrogation, Dorball admitted his participation in the Schiller abduction, then stopped talking. His last comment to detectives, I'll never see daylight again. John Meese quietly left the auditorium where his National Physique Committee's Florida's Men's State Championship competition was taking place at the Knight Center under police escort and was taken in for questioning. When people do really shitty things like this, it always makes me proud when the police show up at a big event so they go down in front of all of their friends. And this is horrible. And a lot of it, you know, was supported by Meese. That's the frustrating part. Okay, so now five days later, a multi-agency task force flew to the Bahamas, and they found Lugo at a hotel Montague in Nassau and brought him back in handcuffs to Miami on a commercial flight, which they had gotten him in front of all his friends. So as the plane rolls to a stop in Miami, there was a row of squad cars, police lights flashing, a raid on the tarmac. So basically, they've lit this whole place up. It looks like Christmas in Miami. Now, after his second night in jail on June 10th, 1995, Lugo agreed to reveal the hiding place of the bodies in return for police mentioning his helpfulness to the jury. So, look, I'm going to help you about these people I killed, so I need you to just let the jury know that I'm okay, that I'm not as bad guy as you think I am. (laughs) This fucking guy. Now, he brought them to the submerged barrels in southwest Miami. However, the drums did not contain the heads, hands, and feet of the victims that were crucial to the identification that Lauren and I spoke about earlier. Now, following this event, Lugo ceased cooperation with police, so he takes them to the part of the bodies that they can't identify them, which is not going to be helpful. You know what I mean? They, so yeah. It's, it's, it's the torso, I think, is what was in the barrels, the hands and everything they had left in buckets on Alligator Alley. Yeah. This That's why this case is so mind-blowing. The body of Christina Furton was later identified through her breast implant serial numbers, 
which was matched to the records held by her plastic surgeon. It would be the first time in Dade County that primary identification of a murder victim was developed through breast implants. On July 7th, an anonymous mail caller said the victim's hands, feet, and heads had been put into buckets, sprinkled with acid, and placed alongside Alligator Alley between the Sawgrass Expressway and the Seminole Indian Reservation. It is unclear if any of them were found. Well, during the summer and fall of 1995, police did make more arrests. Carl Weeks and Stephen St. Pierre, who we spoke about earlier, they had participated in the Schiller abduction and they were hauled in by the police. Sun Jim owner John Meese, who had been released after his initial interrogation, now found himself back in police custody. So they've arrested him again. So did Lugo's mistress, Sabina Predescue. And Dorball's new wife, Cindy Eldridge, faced charges too. Yes, in the midst of all this chaos, Dorball had managed to marry a sweet nurse named Cindy, who had absolutely no clue who her <laughs> new husband really was. Right. So she, he'd gotten married, and now she gets arrested like, what the hell's going on? I did nothing. So the cops arrested everyone, and we mean everyone. Little Mario Gray, who helped dump the barrels, a Sun Gym member who had altered the VIN number on Diana Schiller's BMW, a former trainer at the gym who'd been paid to be an intimidator during Schiller's kidnapping, and more. Anyone who was associated with Lugo, Dorball, and Delgado and their illegal activities was put in jail. Most of them were open with police and received relatively light sentences. But on March 27, 1996, a Dade County grand jury returned a 46-count indictment against the leaders of the Sun Gem Gang for conspiracy to commit the murders of Frank Grigia and Christina Furton and the kidnapping, extortion, and attempted murder of Mark Schiller. And Jorge Delgado was the first major defendant to crack. He gave a confession to Assistant State Attorney Gail Levine and in turn received just 15 years for the Schiller crimes and concurrent five-year sentence for his role in the Grigia Furton case. He also agreed to testify against all the others. So basically, he's jumped ship. He's like, I'm out. I got to save my own ass, which we find in this genre happens quite often. So the trials of Daniel Lugo and Noel Adrian Dorball and John Meese occurred simultaneously with two juries picked, one listening to the evidence against Lugo and the second to listen to the evidence against Dorball and Meese. The trial, which began February 24th of 1998, was the longest and most expensive criminal trial in the history of Dade County. It featured more than 1,200 pieces of physical evidence and 98 witnesses, including Mark Schiller. When the prosecution rested, Lugo and Dorball's attorneys chose not to even present a defense. John Meese's public defender called just one witness. None of the defendants took the stand. And on May 4th of 1998, Lugo's jury convicted him of two murders as well as 16 other charges including racketeering, kidnapping, attempted extortion, theft, attempted murder, armed robbery, burglary, money laundering, forgery, and being a douchebag. And Dorball was also found guilty of the two murders plus 13 additional charges. On June 1st, of 1998, Dorball's jury deliberated just 14 minutes before recommending the death sentence. 14 minutes. One week later, Lugo's panel deliberated just 18 minutes before voting for the death penalty, too. John Meese was convicted of 39 felony counts, including two counts of first-degree murder, attempted murder, racketeering, and multiple counts of money laundering, fraudulent notary, and forgery. On the eve of the trial... The prosecution had offered him a plea bargain, nine years in state prison. He'd already served two and a half in the county jail since his arrest. But Meese rejected that deal, and on July 21st, Judge Farrar, who overturned the racketeering and murder convictions citing insufficient evidence, sentenced the accountant to 56 years in prison. 56 years in prison, all because this guy was trying to juggle his accountant life with his gym life and hired some douchebag named Lugo yeah. and believed in him and let this guy basically destroy everything around him. And with that being said, the Sun Jim case is now closed. 
But there is one thing, Lauren, that I think a lot of our listeners really need to know about here. Mark Schiller. Remember, he was the first to be kidnapped because they wanted to get his money. They took his house. They they made his family leave. They did all of these awful things to him. And if you remember, I mean, they drugged him. They beat him. They made him defecate on himself. I mean, all this shit happened to him. Nobody wanted to believe Mark Schiller. As he's leaving the courtroom, when he testified against the Sun Jim gang, he gets faced with detectives. And they arrest him for the original fraud case because apparently he had done some fraud cases for Medicare fraud. Remember, he was this accountant. And on March 17th of 1999, Schiller had to plead guilty to one count of fraud. And he was sentenced to 46 months of imprisonment. Now, he was released in 2001. I hope he wasn't in the same prison as Lugo (sighs) and Dorball. I can't think so. I don't think so. So... Now, Schiller, for this whole thing, claims he was innocent on this fraud case, but he re- he he basically just said, look, I've got no fight left. I quit. So he basically said, I'm guilty. But this guy, after all this shit that he's gone through, had to spend 46 months in prison after losing his wealth and all this stuff. And I guess that's that. That's he, a law. He broke the law. Whatever he did, karma kicked his ass. Yeah. That's all I got to say. But like I said, the Sun Jim case is now over. And, and the Sun Gym itself is now closed. Thank God. It should have been closed <laughs> before it started. Right. But again, like I said, that's just, you know, sometimes sometimes you just got to be careful who you hire to do things because you don't know really – you you really just don't know who people are. As anyone that's in the true crime genre knows, sometimes that's just how it is. So, um, Lauren, that was a long – Messed up case. Yes, it was. So I think that does bring us to the end. And um, I guess that's going to be it for tonight. That's going to be it for this case. Uh, first case of the year. Again, everyone, happy new year. Happy 2020. Happy, happy 20. Wait, did you say 2022 or 20, 2022? 2022. Okay, 2022. Because we don't need another 2020. No. Um, and uh, guys, start tuning in because I think every Monday you're going to start getting cases from Paradise After Dark. Yes, every so, Monday. So let's do this. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That is P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And check out our website for links to all of our social media, Patreon, our awesome little merch store, and much, much more. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. Yeah, because I think we might just start reading some five-star reviews if someone wants to leave one. Yeah. And again, everyone, this case was crazy, and we want to thank you so much for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.